nothing was bleeding or stinging, must not have been a bad night. He tucked his long, dark brown hair behind his ears. It was always this way after the change, like he'd awakened from a nightmare of falling from a great height. He pushed himself off the mountainous forest floor, glad it was no longer winter as he brushed the leaves and dirt off his naked body. Over the last five years, he'd awakened several times covered in blood from head to toe, each time with no memory of what the night before had held. All he could hope for that he was a good deer hunter and not an unconscious serial killer. He began the walk home, glad that he could now walk barefoot on his property. It had taken a lot of rock clearing. Right now, he just wanted to shower and go to bed. His body needed to rest. He'd moved here after what he thought of as the Gatlinburg incident. The purebred werewolves, as he thought of them, kept their minds when they turned and could turn at will. They were more like shapeshifters and not like true werewolves of legend. He, on the other hand, was more like the werewolves of legend, something to be feared, avoided, unloved, and destroyed, something to be put down. He supposed he should be glad he was alive, but sometimes it was hard to muster the will to continue. On the night of the full moon, and the day before and after, he'd transform into a wolf no matter what. He'd tried everything. Meditation. Forcing himself into a daydream. Ignoring it. Nothing worked. He had found the purebreds once, but learned they could change at will as they chased him off. He supposed he was lucky that turning him into a werewolf was all the damage they did. After all, they could have simply eaten him. But they didn't. They ran him off, making it clear not to return, leaving him alone to figure this out. He looked up at the treetops, now familiar to him, as he wandered back to his cabin, enjoying the knowledge that he wouldn't change again for another month. In wolf form, he was out of control and had massive strength, judging by the large black bear he struggled to get out from under from when he awakened once. Another time, he'd woke up with a broken arm. At first, he'd panicked. He couldn't go to the doctor on the first night of the cycle. He'd change at the hospital and endanger everyone at the beginning of the second night. But he needn't have worried. It had healed by the time he had found his way back to his cabin. He called it the wolf healing. He took in a breath as he saw the roof to his smoky mountain cabin over the hill. Home. He smiled. At first he mourned the loss of his Manhattan life as if someone he loved died. But he'd half built this small cabin himself. Only the foundation and outer wall frame were put in for him. He'd sawed logs and put in everything else on his own. His 300 acres were a haven from the upheaval that his life in Manhattan had been. Now, this summer, he'd turned 30 with no family and no prospects of family. He was damned to be a hermit and engage in his food canning hobby forever. Everything he'd worked for was gone or useless since he couldn't really leave his property for more than a few days. He'd structured his investments to give him an income of about $1.1000 a month, but even that was too much for his self-imposed limitations. With the nearest neighbor being several miles away, he rarely saw anyone, only two people, hunters who wandered too far last year. He'd fixed and reposted his signs, although he figured it'd be an even hunt if they wanted to stalk prey on his property during the wolf cycle. He paused. Maybe other hunters had come on his land. After all, he didn't change back until daybreak. What if he'd killed them? He shook his head. The wolf didn't usually wander from its kill. He had never awakened next to human remains. But how did he know the wolf stayed with its kill? Maybe it killed more than one, and he just awakened with the final one. Greedy wolf, he muttered. There was no sense in driving himself nuts with it. But given his level of greed prior to becoming a werewolf, he couldn't help but wonder if the trait carried over to his wolf. He paused. An old truck was parked in front of his cabin. He hid behind some trees to hide the fact that he was naked, before he realized it was the wolves. The purebreds. Hey, what do you want? Piss off, he yelled as he walked up the hill waving at them to leave, not caring that he was nude. I haven't bothered you. At least not that he knew of. Who knew what the wolf inside him had done? The wolf could have run to their home and shit in the yard without cleaning it up for all he knew. They dumped what appeared to be the body of a child out. Greg got himself in over his head last night. We don't go after kids. It attracts the wrong type of attention, especially if she dies. We don't want to put her down but can't care for her. And she certainly can't go back to her family. She's yours now. A young man in a dark t-shirt tossed down a pink backpack and got back in the truck, and it sped away. Greg. He never knew any of the names of the purebreds. Well, strictly speaking, he still didn't know who Greg was. But he had a name. 
He ran up to the girl, brushing her light brown hair out of her bloody face. She looked to be about seven or eight or so. He wasn't sure how big eight-year-olds were. The bite mark on her neck was trickling blood but looked like it was already healing. He opened one of her dark green eyes. The same bright yellow flecks of the wolf were forming in her irises. They were subtle but tell-tale. His own brown eyes had been solid brown, but now bore the yellow flecks, giving them a hazel look. No. He stood and looked down the driveway, but the truck was long gone. Wonderful. I have an injured, kidnapped child at my house. He needed to call the police. How? He didn't have a phone. He needed to allow her time to heal and get... Get what? He pulled his fingers through his hair. What the actual hell was he going to do right now? Return a dangerous, mythical creature to a human family who would be dead during the next cycle? She'd wake up covered in her family's blood. She'd never be right again, no matter what he did right now. The purebreds were right. But this... This, he couldn't let go. The purebreds would have to pay for this. He'd have to find a way to make that happen. He picked the girl up and carried her inside to the couch. He showered and dressed before heading back out to the couch and using a warm washcloth to wipe her face. He took off her blood-soaked shirt and put her in one of his shirts. He opened a jar of some of his canned venison stew while she continued to heal. He feared she would awaken, afraid, away from her parents. God, what was he going to do? How did this happen? The purebreds that dropped her off appeared to be upset with Greg. He hoped somewhere that Greg was facing the consequences for this and that they were severe. He sat down at the table and waited to let the stew cool. One good thing about being a wolf was that the freezer was always stocked with meat. The solar panels had been the last of his big capital money. The remaining money was locked in long-term funds. Still, he couldn't regret spending the last of the disposable income on the amazing and positive change that having electricity brought into his life. He didn't have to steal salt from the warehouse anymore to preserve his meat. He didn't like being a thief so he'd had to let go of some of his greed and make other changes with income. It was just too dangerous for him to be around people. It had taken almost three years before he had garnered enough courage to make a trip to a Walmart. And that was a 45-minute drive. He had been careful to make sure that it was in the middle of the month, so there would be no danger of changing. But a child? What was he going to do with a child who wouldn't be as rational as an adult? Would she just sit here for a month? Months on end? What would he do if he were seven or eight? He'd get bored after he was too tired to panic anymore. He opened the bright pink backpack. It was a larger backpack, more like she had been camping rather than going to school. He pulled out a small princess sleeping bag and a few Barbie dolls. There were two changes of clothes in it. That wasn't much to work with. He searched some of the pockets and found a school ID bearing the name Tabitha Pierce on it. It was from a school in Nevada. Well, at least he knew her name. The picture matched the girl laying on the couch. He sipped at his stew, watching her sleep. The wound was almost completely healed now. What would he do when she woke up? She would, no doubt, panic. He would panic. He did panic. After all, if she remembered being attacked by a pack of wolves, wouldn't that be cause for panic? He could hardly blame her. Still, he did not want to deal with a crying, screaming, panicking child. He buried his face in his hands and shook his head. What if the police came here and found her? They would lock him up for kidnapping. Then they would shoot him to death on the first night of the first cycle that he spent in jail. He would turn back into his human form, and they would claim pretty much whatever they wanted to as they buried him in the prison graveyard. It would be a far cry from the hopeful days after graduating from Harvard with a Master of Business. He had no family left to miss him. No one to care or ask questions if he went missing. Hell, he was effectively missing for that matter. If it weren't for the fact that he filed taxes every year, the IRS would probably officially report him missing. He was held up here in the mountains where the nearest main road was nearly a 30-minute drive. He'd never reported back to work. He had never called his girlfriend after she left that night in Gatlinburg. Never signed up for utilities or anything that could bring wires to the house. The only thing he had installed was a water pump in the kitchen. Walking to the waterfall near the back of the property had been exhausting so it seemed like a prudent thing to do when the cabin was placed. The workers had told him he was lucky, because getting a well was difficult in the area. He sighed. It would have been so much easier if the purebreds had killed him five years ago. Mama? the girl murmured. Great, he scowled. She was waking up and asking for the family that would surely be missing her. 
He took a few bites of his stew as he watched her. She lay motionless, but her eyes were flickering like she was trying to wake up, but was still too tired. He sighed. It had been so long since he spoke or even seen another human, let alone a child. What would he have wanted that first day he woke up? A hospital with a witch doctor who could have undone this damning magic. He smirked. What would he have wanted second? Someone to hold his hand and tell him it would eventually be okay. He got up and crossed the small kitchen and living room in three steps to kneel next to her. Young miss. He took her hand. Young miss. Can you tell me what happened? He patted her hand. He wanted to see if she would be willing to tell him her name. Mama, she murmured, her eyes opening and then closing. Where's my mama? What is your name? He asked, trying to think of something that would distract her from her mother. But if he were seven or eight and lost, there would be nothing to keep him from wanting his mother. You have been injured. I can help you. Can you tell me your name? Should he tell her the truth? He supposed it would sound insane, but even if he lied, it would only last a month. But that month would be filled with terror at the hands of what she would no doubt believe to be a mad kidnapper who lived in the woods. God, he hated those purebreds. Going after children they were risking exposing their community to the world. Maybe that wasn't a bad thing. Maybe he should call the police, and the authorities could hunt them down. Still, that would expose him too. It would start an investigation. There would be questions he didn't want to answer. Young miss, can you tell me who you are? I am Blaine Marlowe. Where were you when you got injured? Tabitha. Mama calls me Tabby. She sat up, looking around. Where am I? My home. Some wolves were here. I was worried they would come back. So I brought you inside. He could start with a partial truth. She nodded. Wolves. I remember them. I saw four of them. They were running. Mama was photographing them. She sells the photos. She frowned. Then her eyes widened. The wolves. They chased us. Mama. They jumped on Mama. The purebreds killed her mother for taking pictures of them. It was stupid. The purebreds looked like ordinary timber wolves, except a bit bigger. But in the context of the forest, no one would notice by looking at the photos. Why would they risk it? But then, the purebreds seemed somewhat upset with the one called Greg. Maybe they didn't collectively risk it. Maybe it was just as the Alpha said, Greg went against the grain. Or maybe Greg was the Alpha about to be unseated. He blew out a sigh. You gave me quite a fright. I thought you were dead when I saw you. Another partial truth. Her brow knitted and tears started running down her pale face. Where is my mama? He shook his head. I don't know. We can go look for her. And pray they don't find the remains. When you are feeling stronger. She put her hands over her face. I, I, I th think one bit me on the neck. She frowned and put her hands around her neck. But the wound was long gone. Her stomach growled as her eyes teared over. He stood and got her a bowl of stew. Here. This will help fill you up. Then we can talk again. You have been through an ordeal. She nodded, taking the bowl. Who are you? Where is my mama? My name is Blaine. I saw the wolves, but I didn't see your mother. Do you remember where you were? She shook her head. We were in the woods. Mama takes pictures. She gets money for them. Blaine nodded. Do you remember where you were staying? Gatlinburg, Pigeon Forge, Knoxville? Oak Ridge is close. She shook her head. We just moved here, well, to Asheville. Mama and I were camping and taking spring pictures of the mountains. My grandma. She heaved a sigh as the tears finally spilled over. Well, my grandma couldn't take care of me anymore. You lived with grandma? He wasn't sure what to say to her. Asheville was about a three-hour drive. She nodded. She was a card dealer at a casino in Reno, but she retired. She said mama was too young to have me, so I got to be grandma's special star. Her voice cracked and more tears flowed. I want my mama. Where is she? Crap. He'd bet a million dollars her grandmother died and now she was stuck with a neglectful mother. He wanted to give her a hug, but thought that might be too creepy for a stranger to hug her. I don't know. We can look for her once you have eaten and rested. He wasn't sure about the wisdom of suggesting that, but was at a loss for words, and that was the only thing that came to mind. Perhaps tomorrow we can drive you to your home and see if she is there. Can we go today? I wish we could, but I... I... 
he stuttered. I work midnights, and I have to sleep. He could feel the fatigue starting to fall over him like a blanket. I am too tired to drive three hours, but I can tomorrow. It's not a problem. Those wolves. She eyed her stew like it offended her. They seemed like they were smart. They all went after Mama and left me alone, except that big, mean one. Well, wolves are pack hunters. They almost always hunt together. It was true. Wolves were pack hunters. But he also knew the purebreds could do much more than pack hunt. She just wouldn't have understood it as a language. He only was able to identify it as a language after his first transformation, when he'd tried to hunt them down but couldn't get out of the room he was in. Apparently, doorknobs were a challenge for him in wolf form. He'd heard them outside the room for a few minutes. They left once they realized he couldn't get out. Then he'd passed out. Tabby, what about your father? Maybe if he took her into town and left a note explaining to lock her in the basement at the first sign of the full moon. No, the idea was stupid. What father would believe that enough to do it? She was now his responsibility. Don't have one. Well, I do. But I have never met him. Mama said he doesn't even know that I exist. And that's a good thing for us. She said he was mean. She looked at her stew, tapping it with her spoon like it might explode as she curled her nose. I had a dad like that. Your mama did the right thing. I was lucky. My mom and dad were able to come back together and get along. He pointed at the stew. I haven't poisoned that, you know. I can taste test it for you if you like. You have, well, you've had a shock and your tummy is rumbling. We need to build your energy back up. There was no point in pointing out an injury. It was long healed and gone. It was how the transformation took place. Bones would stretch and break and heal instantly in the form of the wolf. It was painful. He'd tried taking Oxycontin, but apparently it didn't matter. The opioid didn't work with the wolf magic. It was thirty seconds of hell, and he'd learned to be grateful that it wasn't longer. Maybe it was longer. Maybe it was just the wolf taking over his mind. After all, once the transformation happened, he only had a one or two second glimpse into the wolf's mind before he passed out from the pain. She sipped at the stew. It's funny, but good. I like it. He smiled. It's venison. Deer meat. She ate the stew more heartily. How old are you? Just turned eight last month. She handed the empty bowl to him. He took it, dreading the next question she would ask. Can we go look for Mama now? He sighed. Yes, of course. There was no point in trying to get her to stay in the cabin. It would only frighten her more than she needed to be. Besides, she was undoubtedly here for the long haul, and the sooner he accepted that the better. She couldn't return to the humans, and she couldn't stay with the purebreds. She'd eventually be grateful the purebreds didn't keep her. Besides, it would be a good opportunity for her to learn the boundaries of the property. She would need to know them for the future. The back landowner wasn't very friendly, and avoiding his property would keep the neighbor from coming to the cabin to complain.